Hello, and welcome back to Lecture 3. In our previous lecture, we began our examination of some of the most important theories about myth by looking at what I call what theories of myth. In this lecture, we're going to move on to the why theories of myth and look at the psychological theories of Freud and Jung, the structuralist approaches of Propp, Levi-Strauss, and Burkert. We'll also discuss the work of the very popular theorist Joseph Campbell. This century has seen the development of crucially important, extremely influential, and very complex theories about myth, which fall under the category that I've called why theories. Again, obviously, all I can do is, is scratch the barest surface of these theories, but we will begin with the psychological theories of Freud and Jung, and then move on to structuralist theories. The thing that these why theories have in common is that they assume myth reflects the same underlying human realities in all cultures, and that myth therefore is somehow cross-cultural or transcultural, rather than being specific to the individual culture in which it develops. So let's begin with Sigmund Freud. Among his other contributions to modern thought, Freud proposed that myth reflects psychological forces present in the individual and through the individual, of course, present in society. Clearly, his most important contribution to the study of myth was his interpretation of Sophocles' treatment of Oedipus the king to develop his own, Freud's own, theory of the Oedipus complex. Freud developed the Oedipus complex as a theory after he asked himself why it was that Sophocles' tragedy about Oedipus the king was still so compelling, so electrifying to modern audiences. Freud disagreed with the interpretation given by most critics of his time, which was that it was the interaction of fate and free will in that drama that made it so compelling. The fact that Oedipus by trying to avoid his fate through the use of his free will, drives himself ever more inexorably into his fate. Freud said that can't explain its popularity because there are other dramas written about the interaction of fate and free will that are not so compelling, that do not retain their popularity centuries after they were written or even decades after they were written. Therefore, he thought the appeal of the story of Oedipus must lie not in the fate free will issue, but in something specific to that narrative, in the details of that story, rather than in its wider issues. And of course, the details of the Oedipus story are that Oedipus is a man who killed his father and married his mother. Freud saw this as reflecting the repressed desires of all male children to do away with their fathers and have access to their mothers. According to Freud, not just the Oedipus myth, but myths in general are in effect the collective dreams of the human race. By that he meant that he thought myths utilize the same kind of imagery, condensation, and displacement that we find in our own individual dreams. And he thought that the imagery of myth was similar to the imagery of dreams. And of course, in both cases, Freud thought that this imagery was primarily sexual in nature. Oedipus is a story about, at least in part, about a sexual relationship, but Freud saw sexual imagery in other myths as well. The second great psychological theorist of this century to grapple with myth was, of course, Carl Jung. Jung saw myths as reflections of the collective unconscious. In particular, Jung thought that myth draws on archetypes which are contained in the collective unconscious. By archetypes he meant more or less recurrent images that exist cross-culturally and throughout time. Images such as the image of the wise old man, the earth mother, the maiden, that sort of thing. Jung thought that myth utilizes these images, these archetypes, and that we find myth compelling because we too partake of the archetypes as we partake of the collective unconscious. Because myth, according to Jung, reflected the archetypes of the collective unconscious, he thought that myths were crucially important, both for the individual and for society. He probably accorded more importance to myth than Freud did. Now, so the psychological approach is only one universalist, or to use my terminology, why, approach to myth. The other 
main school of thought that is developed around myth in this century is what's called structuralism. Structuralism is very difficult to define briefly and simply. The best definition I found is given by the scholar Walter Burkert, who says that structuralism is a system of definable relations between the parts or elements of a whole which admit predictable transformations. The predictable transformations part of that definition is what's crucially important in it, that according to structuralism, the component elements, the system of definable relations between the parts or elements of a whole, will interact with one another in predictable ways, whether the whole that we're talking about is society in general, language, myth, or some other system. Structuralism says that its parts interact with one another in a predictable manner. There are two primary varieties of structuralist theory that I want to look at here. The first is often called the formalist school. Some people separate it from structuralism entirely and call it formalism instead. It was developed by a Russian folklorist named Vladimir Prop, who analyzed traditional tales based on their surface elements based on the actual narrative elements that appear in these traditional tales. Looking at Russian folktale, Prop found one basic pattern of tale, which could be called the quest pattern, which he further analyzed into 31 separate elements, or as he called them, 31 separate functions. Now, an important thing to understand about Prop's kind of analysis, about formalist analysis, is he was not saying that every single tale would have all 31 of these functions. One story might have functions 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 9, 13, 15, and so forth. Another story might have uh, functions 1, 2, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 15, 17, and so forth. But when you study the entire body of traditional tales, you find the same functions, and this is crucial, they appear in the same order. Thus, it is the sequence of functions which creates or defines the tale for a formalist analysis, not the characters who happen to appear in the tale. The characters are not the tale's defining characteristic, to you make a bad pun that I didn't realize I was about to make. Um, let me give an example to try to clarify this. We could say that a tale in a formalist analysis may include the elements of a young man being driven out of his home by a wicked elder male relative going on a journey in which he encounters several monsters, killing at least one of those monsters, and as a reward for his efforts being given the hand of a princess in marriage. Whether we call that hero Jason or Perseus or Prince Charming or Luke Skywalker makes very little difference. The tale, the story, is the same. That's the basic understanding of formalism. The second main category of structuralism, and in fact what most people are referring to when they talk about a structuralist approach to myth, looks at the underlying structure of the myth rather than at the surface narrative of a given myth. This approach was developed by Claude Lévi-Strauss. The main point, or a main point, of Lévi-Strauss's theory is his claim that myth exists to mediate contradictions, that human society, and indeed human thought in general, operates through a series of binary contradictions, binary oppositions, and that myth and other structures of society exist to mediate these contradictions or these oppositions. Oppositions such as the opposition between nature and culture, which Lévi-Strauss says appears among other ways in the opposition between raw food and cooked food. Raw food standing for nature, cooked food standing for culture. Another opposition that myth could mediate would be between gods and humans, between death and life, that sort of thing. Lévi-Strauss claims that not just human culture, but human thought itself operates through these binary oppositions and that many of our cultural structures and artifacts exist to mediate these oppositions. This form of structuralism developed as a subcategory of linguistics. It was applied first to language and then was expanded to include other systems such as myth. Under structuralism, under Lévi-Strauss's structuralism, myth is seen as analogous to language, just as the individual components of language, the sounds or phonemes, have no inherent meaning in themselves. The sound k has no meaning by itself. The sound t 
has no meaning by itself. Put a vowel in between them to get cat or cut or cot, and you start to have meaning. The individual sounds mean nothing. It's a relationship to one another that conveys meaning. Levi-Strauss would say that the components of myth, which are sometimes called mythemes, to press the analogy with phonemes, the components of myth have no independent meaning by themselves. Oedipus by himself means nothing. It's only putting the, these components into relationship with one another that gives them meaning. One of Levi-Strauss's most controversial claims is his statement that a myth is made up of all its variants. And by all its variants, he means all its variants, not just within the culture that developed it, but also within any culture that refers to it or uses it. So Levi-Strauss says that Freud's interpretation of the Oedipus myth, Freud's theory of the Oedipus complex, is now part of the Oedipus myth. And if we're going to analyze the Oedipus myth, we have to take Freud into account no less than we take Sophocles into account. So he gives a very broad, elongated through time definition of what a myth is. A more recent development in structuralism is the work of Walter Burkert, the same man whose definition of structuralism I quoted a few minutes ago, who has developed a structuralist approach that differs from both Props and Levi-Strauss's in assigning the basic impetus for certain myths to what he calls biological programs of action. Burkert's theory resembles Props in that he isolates narrative elements that recur in different myths, in different tales, and from them identifies certain types of tale. One example of this is what Burkert calls the girl's tragedy. In the girl's tragedy, as analyzed by Burkert, there's a sudden break in a young girl's life which causes her to leave home. She then undergoes a period of seclusion which, which comes to an end in a violent encounter with a male, often a god, sometimes a human, sometimes even an animal. This violent encounter results in her pregnancy. She then undergoes a period of tribulation, suffering, and punishment, but at the end of the story she's rescued and reintegrated into society, often given a new and higher status in society, often through the birth of a child, of a son. Now, Burkert's contribution, so far, so much like prop, Burkert's contribution is to say that these kinds of stories reflect underlying biological realities. The male, the, the girl's tragedy, the female tragedy, he connects to the stages of a young girl's puberty and maturation, so that her, the sudden break in her life would be menarche, her first menstruation, followed often in many cultures by actual seclusion in a kind of initiation ceremony. The catastrophe, that the violent encounter with a male, would be defloration, her first sexual encounter. The period of tribulation and suffering would be her pregnancy. And the happy ending, the rescue, would be the birth of her child and her emergence as an adult woman. His thesis that these narrative elements are rooted in the in actual biological realities, biological realities that can be per traced beyond early human all the way back to pre-human culture, is controversial to say the least. By no means every scholar accepts this thesis, but that is Burkert's main contribution. He also assigns great importance to ritual, particularly to initiation rituals. And so he is sometimes referred to as a neo-ritualist, as well as being a structuralist. Now, the best known theorist of myth, at least in America, the best known theorist of myth to appear in recent decades is Joseph Campbell. And though Campbell is often called a Jungian and shows many resemblances to Jung's theory of the archetypes in his work, a better term to describe his approach to myth might actually be metaphysical. Campbell assumes that he takes as a given the idea that all myth is the same cross-culturally, that myth functions in the same way in every society, that myth reflects a reality of the human mind that is recognizable and is the same throughout cultures and across time. Like Fraser's, his method depends largely on gathering examples of narrative similarities from different cultures. Now that's, as anyone who's seen his lectures or read his books will remember, that's one of the main things he does, is cite different examples of what he sees as the same narrative elements from many different cultures.
he assumes that myth is true in a metaphysical or spiritual sense. By that I mean he imputes a spiritual meaning to myth that he thinks is constant across societies and across time, but is also crucial for individual psychological and spiritual health. In other words, Campbell sees the main function of myth as an expression of a particular spiritual reality in the human mind. That's what he thinks myth is, what he claims that myth is. Interestingly, Campbell separates this spiritual element of myth from the specific religious doctrines held by the societies that formed the myths. So rather than thinking that myth is understandable only within, his culture, within a particular culture, Campbell tends to say that myth is most understandable outside of culture because the religious doctrines imposed by culture he sees as distortions of the original spiritual meaning of myth. Now, and Joseph Campbell is an extraordinarily engaging lecturer and author, and he is very, very popular. But despite his popularity, most scholars, and I include myself here, do not have a high opinion of Campbell's work. There are several main reasons for this. First of all, he never attempts any rigorous demonstration of the validity of his interpretations of myth. Instead, he simply asserts his interpretations as a given. He assumes that all myth reflects one spiritual truth, or rather he assumes that there is one spiritual cast to the human mind, that that is part of the essence of being human, and that myth reflects it. Both of those assumptions are questionable, even if we agree, which many people would not, that there is one spiritual cast to the human mind. The assertion that myth reflects that spiritual cast of the human mind needs to be argued and not simply asserted. As I say to my students when I assign them term papers, assertion is not evidence. To simply say that something is so is not to give evidence that it is so. And Campbell doesn't ever give evidence. He simply states his belief that myth reflects one spiritual reality and takes that as a given throughout his work. If you agree with him that it does, if you agree with this interpretation, then his work may be very compelling. But if you don't agree, he never gives any evidence to show why you should. Secondly, he claims, Campbell claims, to be discussing narratives that occur worldwide, uh, narratives that he calls monomyths. He claims that the same mythic narrative occurs worldwide throughout cultures and throughout time. But he constructs these narratives or demonstrates these narratives by taking one narrative element from a story in one culture, another from a story in another culture, yet a third from a story in yet another culture, puts them all together and says, here is the monomyth, here is the underlying narrative. But in fact, that underlying narrative doesn't exist in any culture. Now, you may be thinking, but wait a minute, isn't that what you just said Prop and Burkert do? But there's a difference. Prop works within Russian folktale, within one culture, and finds the different elements that make up his tale within one culture. So does Burkert when he's talking about the maid's tragedy, the girl's tragedy, for instance. He's looking at Greek culture. Campbell ranges across time and across cultures, takes an element from, say, Polynesia, another from Native American myth, another from ancient Greek myth, puts them all together and says they all refer to a monomyth, to a narrative structure that does not exist in any one of these cultures. That is questionable. That's an assumption that many of us find ourselves unable to make. He also tends to assume that mere multiplication of examples amounts to proof of his interpretation. So if he can find 10 examples of a hero going out and slaying a dragon, he assumes that this amounts to proof of his interpretation of what that narrative element means. But in fact, multiplication of examples and interpretation of what those examples means what those examples mean are two very different things. A mere listing of parallel examples tells us nothing about the validity or lack of validity of any given interpretation of those examples. And finally, Campbell, as I've touched on in all of these objections, assumes that similar narrative elements must have precisely the same meanings in different cultures. That is a very, very questionable assumption, to say the least. To take an example, classical Greek myth, classical Athenian myth, and modern American culture both have stories about Amazons. 
warrior women, women who fight against male warriors, who live without males, who have sexual relationships without marriage, who do not depend on males to protect them or to save them in any situation of violence. In Greek myth, they appear all over the place. In fact, I'll deal with them in a le lecture late in the course. In modern American culture, they appear in such popular guises as the television program Xena Warrior Princess, the comic book Wonder Woman of many years ago. And yet, despite the fact that these figures are very, very similar, independent, strong, warrior women who use violence as much as men use violence, it would be a grievous mistake to think that they have the same implication in ancient Greek society and in modern American society. For the Athenians, the Amazons were examples of exactly what women must not be. They were frightening, they were horrifying, they were repulsive, and they are constantly overcome by heroes who resexualize them and put them back in their places. In modern American culture, at least the fans of Xena Warrior Princess see her as an affirmation, an example of a strong, independent woman of what women can do on their own to protect themselves without men. I have friends who encourage their young daughters to watch Xena because they think she's such a wonderful role model. Same idea, same image, entirely different meaning in two different cultures. Now, clearly, it could be objected that Xena is not a myth in the sense I've defined myth. This television program is intentionally written by modern American writers with an agenda, with an axe to grind. Fair enough. But what about a more basic image, a more basic narrative element, something that shows up worldwide? What about snakes? In Judeo-Christian culture, snakes are symbols of evil. The snake tempted Eve in the garden. The snake led us all astray. The snake is always a symbol of evil. But in Greek culture, snakes can be evil. Huge, monstrous, dragon-like snakes usually are, but they can also be beneficent. In fact, a dead hero very frequently appears at his shrine to his worshippers in the form of a snake. Snakes can be, and often are, good images in Greek culture. The same image, but we cannot assume that it has the same meaning. The assumption that symbols must mean exactly the same thing wherever they appear, cross-culturally and throughout time, is a very dangerous assumption to make. Now, I don't mean to pick too much on Joseph Campbell here. I focused so much time on him simply because he is so popular and because many of my students are often very disappointed when they discover that I don't like his work. But in fact, many of the objections I've just raised to Campbell's approach can be raised to universalist why theories in general. These theories tend to rest on unproven and unprovable assumptions. For instance, let's look at the psychological theories of Freud and Jung again. Both Freud and Jung espouse the idea that myths are in some sense the dreams of the people, that myth is to society as dream is to an individual. But what do they mean by that? This implies, this depends on the idea that a people or a society has a collective mind capable of dreaming, which strikes me at least as a rather odd and very problematic assertion. Now I know I've said in my working definition that myths are stories a society tells itself, but that similarity of phrase I think doesn't indicate a similarity of meaning here. When I say that myths are stories a society tells itself, that's a kind of shorthand for saying myths are stories that a great many individuals with, within a society tell. When we say that a society believes in something, American society believes in freedom of speech, what we mean by that is that most individuals within society believe in freedom of speech. But when Freud says myths are the dreams of a society, I don't think he does simply mean that individuals within that society have dreams. I think he's saying something else. I think he's positing that a society can somehow dream just as an individual can. I, at least, don't see how that's possible. I don't see how a society can dream any more than a society can feel hunger or thirst or fall asleep. So Freud posits that myths are dreams of a society or function to a society as dreams do to a human. He doesn't ever demonstrate it. He also assumes that dreams, the symbols in dreams and in myths, have the same significance cross-culturally. One of his main points in his first articulation of the Oedipus complex, one of the things that made Freud think he was on the right track 
is a line in that play where Jocasta says to Oedipus, many a man before you has dreamed of sleeping with his mother. Freud saw that as proof that throughout time, across cultures, male human beings desire as small children to have sexual access to their mothers, feel terrible guilt over this desire, repress it, and it then comes up through their subconscious and manifests itself in their dreams. But if we look at handbooks of dream interpretation that were current in classical Greece and Hellenistic Greece, we find that a dream of sex with one's mother was often seen as a good dream, a good omen. It could indicate that a man was about to return to his native land, for instance, that he was about to get some possessions that he wanted. It does not seem to reflect the guilt and repression that Freud assumes must be operating there. So even if Freud is right that this guilt and repression operate in 20th century male children, that doesn't necessarily prove that they operated in 5th century BC male children. Young posits the collective unconscious and the archetypes, never demonstrates that they exist. Levi-Strauss assumes that the mediation of oppositions is a driving force of all cultures and in fact underlies human thought itself, never demonstrates that this is so. So the objections I had to Campbell's theory apply really to most of these why theories, including Burkert. Burkert assumes that myth is rooted in pre-cultural biological necessities. I find that a fascinating suggestion. I admire Burkert's work greatly, but again, it cannot possibly be demonstrated. It can only be asserted. So where does this leave us? The best approach may be to recognize that myth is a varied category, a recognizable category. Again, we all know it when we see it, but it's hard to pin it down to any one theory, or to put that a little less discouragingly, the best approach may be to recognize that myth can include all of these theories and more. No one theory we've looked at of either the what category or the why category seems to me at least to be sufficient to explain myth overall as a category. That doesn't mean that these theories can't be useful for elucidating individual myths. They can and they certainly are. I would suggest that, what, th that the best way to proceed, what we ought to do, is use these theories in conjunction with one another, see what they can tell us about different myths, but not try to force myth to fit the pattern of any one of them. And to be fair, I should say that while these theories I've discussed can't be proven, they can't be disproven either. There's no way to show that they are incorrect, and they therefore should and can be employed as tools when and where they are useful. Now, my own working definition of myth, again, I define myths as traditional stories a society tells itself that encode or represent the worldview, beliefs, principles, and fears of that society. That definition obviously combines elements from several of the theories that we've looked at. I think, as I hope that definition shows, that myths give us a great deal of insight on what a specific culture thinks about the nature of the world in general and about key elements within the world and about key questions such as the nature and function of the gods. Are there gods? What are they like? What do they do? The relationship that humans ought to have to the gods. What it means to be human. What marks us out from other creatures. Again, as I mentioned in the first lecture, why are there only two sexes? Why can't they get along better with one another? What's all that about? In other words, I tend to see the most interesting approach to myth as one that looks at myths within their originating culture and looks at what the myths can tell us about that culture, rather than looking at them in a more global view. Obviously, I find the universalizing why theories of myth, psychological, structuralist, or what have you, less useful than an approach that examines myth within the culture that developed it. That's my own personal bias, if you want to put it that way, or the way my own personal intellect works. However, throughout the course, I will, as appropriate, point out particular uses of the why theories, particular myths to which those theories have been applied or to which I think they could usefully be applied, and we'll discuss how they work at key points throughout the lectures. Now, we have at this point finished our introductory material, our survey of what myth is and how it works. In the next lecture, we will turn to looking at actual classical mythology itself when we begin discussing 
the myth of the creation of the gods and the creation of the universe as told in hesiod's theogony.